society, we must build these things in order to sustain our efforts to build this majority that will change our country in the interests of the majority. There's a need for practical struggles and demands that can win relatively modest, but often life-enhancing improvements in the here and now. But no less important is the need to build that revolutionary spirit that Elizabeth Gurley Flynn talked about. We've got to give people more than short-term improvements, giving them a clear understanding of what's wrong with the status quo, giving them skills and inspiration and motivation to do something about these problems that we face. In explaining that power concedes nothing without a demand, the great anti-slavery leader Frederick Douglass added an incredibly important insight Find out just what a people will submit to, he pointed out, and you will have found out the exact amount of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. He concluded the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Flowing out of our occupation must be ongoing efforts to build the consciousness, the understanding, the organizational skills, and the capacity for unified and uncompromising struggle that will put an end to such submission and tyranny, giving greater and greater understanding and strength to the majority of our people. That must be the goal of our movement. I'm looking forward to our discussion of this, not only now, but in coming days and weeks and months as we continue the occupation movement and at a certain point as we move to the next level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, all right. That was excellent. Give them a hand, guys. Oh, great speech. Great speech. Let's sing that song, Solidarity Forever. Yeah, yeah that's... You got it's the words, don't you? You ought, to, you ought to get started. I only know the, the chorus. When the truth comes, my the workers' blood shall run. There will be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? For the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. <laughs> All right, I think uh, we're going to have a Q&A section. Just raise your hand if you could, uh, if somebody could keep track of who's raising hands and when so I can go over to them. By the way, it doesn't have to be just Q&A. Chip in your own ideas on some of this stuff, and don't be afraid to disagree or raise a critical question about something that was said, too. Okay, let's see those hands. Yes, right. sir. How do you think they're gonna get the, get the union strong so everybody's represented again in this country? I, I think there might be some other brothers and sisters here who have some ideas on that. Uh, I come from a union family. For my family, for my dad, union was like a religion. It was like the workers joining together to defend each other and all of the workers. And the unions, to a large extent, lost their spirit, became corrupt, and you had a disconnect between the union staff and officers and the union members. So when, I, when I've been in certain unions, some union members talk about what's the union going to get for us? Like the union is some kind of a shyster lawyer as opposed to us together. The only way the labor movement is going to find its soul is by becoming a genuine union of the workers. Tough, democratic, socially conscious unionism. There are some people who are trying to build that. There are some people in the labor movement today who are supporting our struggle, our occupations, because they realize they need the kind of spirit that we represent, but it's, it's not going to happen simply and easily, but it seems to me there's got to be that kind of rebirth of, of the union movement. Well, they've got to reconnect. They've got to reconnect with all society. Everybody can be represented in the union. Yes, Nobody I, will not be. That, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, in your imagination, how would you envision 
success. Maybe success beyond our dreams for the Occupy movement. We are already successful in important ways. We have impacted powerfully on the consciousness and the politics of this country. That's not like, hey, and now we've won, we can go home. It's part of a process, a back and forth. But we have had powerful impact already. No matter what happens, that won't ever be made untrue. I think that the, I, from what I can see right now, the power that we are up against, even though we've gone very far, we've gone further than I thought we would go. I, I, I was betting, hey, after a few days, this would be over. We have come very far. It's hard for me to see how we can sustain this through this winter and then next winter and then the winter beyond that. And will the authorities allow it? And if the authorities come down on us, will we have the power to stop them from doing that? So those are important questions that are raised and that we don't know the answers to right now exactly. But I, I think that coming out of this struggle, as part of this struggle and coming out of this struggle, we've already created a, a powerful change in the country of consciousness and the people in the Pittsburgh occupation, and I know it's true, it's gotta be true here in the other occupations, it's like this amazing experience of thinking, 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 learning, learning, talking, talking, learning new things and so forth, making mistakes, learning from mistakes and so on. So that out of this movement will come layers of organizers and activists and people who will remain committed to the struggle and building a powerful movement of the majority of our people I don't know if we'll get the whole 99%, but damn it, we could get 70%, 80%, that would be pretty good, yeah. to fight the fight that needs to be fought to give the economic and political power to the majority of the people. Now, there are all kinds of issues and questions and problems involved in that that cannot be solved in a really good sound bite <laughs> that will have to be solved and resolved through struggle of people like us sometimes arguing what's the best way to move forward but my belief is the best that the occupation movement can do is do continue to do what it's been doing of transforming consciousness helping to train give people experience give people consciousness motivation to continue to develop themselves to continue that struggle for that power shift that i'm talking about uh i i since since you asked you know, the, uh, you, you've, you've pegged it on the occupation movement itself. That's as best I can do. The occupation movement is part of something longer and larger than that. But it's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, who, who is next? Uh, Who's the 99%? I, I found it very uh, inspiring yesterday to see all over our nation and in London and different places uh, people going out and marching and, and the news coverage, it was amazing to see, you know, Seattle, Portland, Texas, Pennsylvania, uh, and, and even as some of the Occupy sites seem to be under the stress of being shut down, it's my hope and sense that if these movements, if we continue to march, I mean, I, I was just thinking, not only on the weekends, but maybe Fridays and Saturdays, I mean, uh, uh, think of what a Friday is. I mean, still on a Friday, you go out and you disrupt the system that just wants to keep going along, and people really have to think about it while they're trying to get home to their leisurely weekend about what's going on downtown. And then on Saturday, everybody who has to work and can't get out during the week, well, they can join. I think if even if this site sometimes Menino decides, oh, we're going to shut it down, we can still meet and take to the streets regularly and encourage every site in the nation and some around the world all together. And as this goes on and on, we're going to have uh, more than an Arab Spring. We're going to have a democratic uh, American Spring in summer. It could be overwhelming. Why don't we just keep? Bring people into the discussion. I, think, I was just curious about the very beginning of your speech. You talked about Billy Bragg. 
And I had read on the um, on online, I can give you the site if you're interested, about a month ago that he was actually someone who was very critical of the Occupy movement. He went so far as to say it could turn into something similar to the Tea Party. So I was wondering if he had if, if he had come around or if uh, you know if that's part of sort of a larger shift where people who maybe were critical initially have uh, you know changed their minds. Let me just respond to that real fast. No, he's one of us. He's one of us. He was at the occupation site. He was singing. He was. He's with us. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not familiar with these other uh, other comments that may have happened, but he's with us. He's part of the occupation movement. I think this dude with the yellow jacket back was... there too. I'm gonna. Okay. Um, well, some some people have argued that uh, having having a, a strong leadership or almost like figureheads are very useful and they have given uh, previous movements uh, kind of power that, that this does not have. Um, and you had mentioned uh, about how uh, the uh, some of the leaders had actually, you know, gone against the idea of their <coughs> leadership. Now, my, my conception is more of a leadership of ideas. Um, and I was wondering uh, if you could just speak to that. It's really complicated. Martin Luther King, I quoted him, he's great. Uh, Ella Baker, I quoted her, she's great. She was critical of him. She was critical of him for being too much the leader, the great leader. There's a tension, there's going to be a tension in our movement. But I agree basically with what she said about that, and Debs too. And Debs was a great leader. Ideas, ideas, not follow me and I'll set you free. But brothers and sisters, let's talk about this and here's what I think. And if it adds up, then it impacts on your thinking. And let me show you, here's how you can make a leaflet. Now, if we're gonna organize a meeting, this is how we build the meeting. And then here's what we do during the, to make the meeting go. For, to build something, not just to have talk. And then how do you build something, like a demonstration or a more? There's skills. Some of the people here have those skills. One of the responsibilities of people here who have the skills is to use them, but also pass them on, help other people learn how to do it. That's leadership right there, not you know being the great uh, spokesperson. Is it this book over here? Best person on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, right, right, right. I, I want to do this fairly. Okay. The one thing about leaders is because the ruler class likes to get rid of their leader. Then who's your next one? They yeah. try to bribe yeah. their leader, right. kill their leader, right. uh, exile their leader, or something like that. And it's we. Leaders are important depending on the social movement they identify with. If they identify with the ruler class, they're important. If they identify with the masses, they're important. So what we need is a class struggle, democratically run organization, and that one finger part of the fist. We need a unified fist, nationally and internationally, where every finger is respected. And so it's we. I tell people to follow me. I follow we. I want nobody to follow me. I don't follow anybody else. I believe in we. I'll follow you if, if I'm lost here. You know the way I get to the train station. Okay, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> that's different. Other than that, we need yeah. a movement of we. Uh -huh. Yeah. We that's it. Uh, is we want... here. Yeah, go ahead. So um, you uh, talk of the um, uh, uh, the Occupy movement as a sort of. Uh, training ground and a starting off points for other movements in the future. How do you see that actually manifesting itself in the future after the Occupy movement has sort of dissipated? So how, how, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it kind of answered it. Others may also want to get into that, and that's a really good question, and we've got to be talking about it. We are talking about. We got to be talking about it. You know, there's not a, a simple little. Oh well, here's the blueprint. I'm glad you asked. Here's the blueprint. It, it's. Uh, uh, I, I when I was in London, uh, I ran into a woman who's been very involved in the New York occupation, Wall Street occupation. I want to get. This was before they got uh, attacked and and uh, uh, thrown out of uh, the plaza. But she was talking about some kind of uh, summer conference, and something, something in July that some of the occupation folks around the country are talking about doing. That might be one place to discuss this and explore this. This is a place to discuss it, you know, over time. You know, uh, an excellent question, and it's too important a question to give a, a glib answer to. Right here. Right here. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, thanks. You don't have to call me ma'am. 
Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I just wanted to draw people's attention to the Boston Occupier. Today is the first printing. I think 20,000 copies have been printed of our newspaper, our side. And I think that, you know, that's one thing to keep in mind, which is that the, the, the top of society, that 1%, has their leadership that, that is waging an argument that we are wrong, that they are right, that, they ha that they're justified in their ability to profit off of our labor, to exploit and oppress us. And I think the question of our leadership, you know, this is one example of what we're trying to do, which is wage our argument from our side, tell people the truth about what our occupation is about, uh, what our struggle for the 99% is about, and I think, you know, that's, that's part of our leadership. Like, you know, it's not about whether one individual, begin, you know, represents us, but how we can go out and expand our movement. You know, we've had a series of years, 40 years plus, where there's been a one-sided attack from the top of society on our wages, on black people in black neighborhoods, on women, et cetera. And that tide has turned I think in a incredibly transformative way that isn't going to go away uh, very soon. But it matters whether we take these ideas and whether we win other people to not just supporting it, but actually participating in it. And I think that doesn't necessarily have to be an encampment. We have Occupy the Hood happening, which is not an encampment, but is bringing hundreds of people. The first meeting was 500 people at a GA of Occupy the Hood. You know that is a group of people who are going out there and beginning to organize in their communities against foreclosures. Acupemas El Barrio, the first meeting at 120 people. That's not a physical encampment, but that's part of the Occupy movement. Occupy Harvard, Occupy Northeastern, Occupy uh, UMass Boston, etc. I think these are, these are things that, you know, the genie is out of the bottle and can't be quickly put in. We also know, like I said, you know, that their side is highly organized. Part of that is the cops raiding us, brutalizing us, etc. We have to be equally organized. We have to be equally organized to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to be able to, uh, to withstand uh, those attacks. So I think this is, a gr this is a great start. I saw people in Harvard Square today handing these out. I'm sure getting into conversations about what we mean by taxing the rich, you know, et cetera. I think that's, that's part of our growing process of leadership. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Let's give her a hand. Yay! For the, the Boston occupiers. Make sure to pick one up. Give one to your friend. Don't leave. You already know. You are the news. I'm going to get him and then you, okay? So you made the observation that the uh, big railroad strike of 1877 didn't have demands and that that was okay. Um, I think one of the things they did have was a way to bring really clear power to bear on on the, the ruling elite. They were able to stop rail traffic um, in the eastern half of the country, and that ended up costing them a lot of money. So one of the things that we don't have right now, I think, is a way to bring that same kind of power, a way to cost the ruling elite money or to interfere with business as usual. And ultimately, I think at some point, we're gonna have to figure out a way to do that. So I don't, I'm not saying again, sort of in line with what everybody's saying that I have the answer, but I think that's part of the conversation that needs to happen. Did you want to mention something about that? I do this guy, this guy, and then we'll do you. Um, so you had uh, spoken earlier about uh, the conception of uh, power. Um, I've, I've tried to, you know, analyze uh, what what, what gives uh, dominant institutions, historically and in the modern day, what, what are some of the common things that uh, inherently give them power? And there's at least a few things uh, that I, I find uh, that almost all of them have in common. Uh, the first uh, would be access to, to good and useful information. Uh, the second would be a high level of communication and coordination. And the third would be access to resources. And the way, the way I conceive it is that, um, say take like the 1%, they, they have all three of these things, and especially in droves, the access to resources. But the way I figure it is that if these are inherent powers within society, 
the way for the impoverished or the, 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 the way for the people who lack the access to resources in order to gain resources and gain the power is to utilize the first two inherent powers of, of the information and the communication and coordination. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, just any, any thoughts on that? I'd like to... I, I think that's a uh, uh, very thoughtful wrestling with the, uh, the issue, and it seems to me that there's more than simply that. And uh, there's a, I mean, sh they have, <laughs> they have so many resources. They have so many more, you know, hey, let's take up a collection here. It, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what they've got in terms of resources. We have something that they don't have. We have the truth. They are exploiters and oppressors, and they pretend they're not, and Fox News tells lies saying the opposite, not just Fox News. And some, a lot of people want to believe it, but truth trumps hype. And what they do to make their profits is hurting us, and people are feeling it, and people are seeing that. My dad was a union organizer, and he said one of the best organizers for the union is the boss the nature of the system. Now that's not enough, you know, we got a lot of work to do, but that's something going for us in terms of uh, our struggle against what they're doing. Uh, so, you know, I appreciate the, the, the thinking that you're doing, and it, it would make sense for us to be thinking through in all kinds of ways how to be more effective, which is, you know, what you're doing. I really appreciate that a lot. Um, what do you do about um, people at the airport that are non-union and had the union members come out and support the non-union members on a one-day wildcat strike. Yeah, I think that there's a need for solidarity. Now, the, the thing is, in terms of organizing, uh, for me to say, oh, well, here's what should happen, that would be wrong. That is, the people who are involved need to do that. So union workers need to be talking with non-union workers and developing strategies and tactics and some of them might look just like that but it's it's them they're the ones that have got to sort that out you know and and then move on it um, in, in a partial answer to the uh, gentleman's concern or, or, or point that uh, the railroads were able to uh, at least the late late workers and the railroads were able to stop the railroads and we need something similar uh, getting back to my my sense of how exciting seeing the marches all over the country were in San Francisco uh, and uh, I, I think a, even in New York uh, some some of the protesters went and occupied uh, a banks Bank of America now when does the movement you know when we go to march when when do we decide that well we uh, begin occupying or this type of pressure peaceful resistance together against the institutions that are the oppressor and just to make our presence known to them in a slightly more obnoxious way I mean by occupying uh, in front of them uh, right I mean here we are at the Fed but I mean like Bank of America Citicorp all of them they're all together they have uh, and and going in their lobbies and uh, frankly yeah, disrupting business as usual uh, as, as part of a march. And, and if that were done by every occupation movement in America at the same time on a day, on a regular basis, uh, it could have an enormous effect. Uh, but I don't know. I'm just a novice at that. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a start. Yeah. This is a, a, a discussion that needs to go on. Um, uh, my understanding is there are other meetings starting at 6 o'clock that some people have to get to. And uh, although we could be standing here, uh, you know, having a great discussion, you know, for several hours, that might not, that might create a difficulty for some of the folks who are here. I truly appreciate the, uh, having the uh, possibility of coming here and connecting with the occupation here and having this kind of discussion. I appreciate uh, what you're doing here and, and the kind of thinking and discussion that's going on here. What I would suggest is that we end this formal part of the discussion. 
uh, with the understanding that this, this discussion is not going to be stopping, it's going to be going on. You know, when I'm not here, you don't need me to be having this discussion. You're having a, a good discussion. And, but then to connect with brothers and sisters in Pittsburgh, in New York, in et cetera, et cetera. That we, we need to be, we're building a, a unified national movement, diversity, but unity at the same time. Uh, so thank you very much. That's great. Oh, excellent. Everyone give a hand. Uh, we have upcoming speakers for the Zinn Lecture Series. Next week is Michael Denning. The week after that is Bruno Bastilles and Norman Finkelstein. Check it all out at zinnlectures.wordpress.com. Thank you.